Well, good afternoon. We'll go ahead and get started, though we've still got some more people coming in. Um, it'll never happen, but I'll ask anyway. If some of you all uh, on the aisles can move in so the people don't have to crawl over you, that would be uh, uh, a great humanitarian gesture on your part. Uh, <laughs> We are uh, webcasting this live, um, so I will spend just a minute uh, telling you what you in this room already know, uh, but that this is the Woodrow Wilson Center. We are the nation's official memorial to President Wilson, who combined uh, a scholarly, not simply career, but uh, really an excellence in the field of scholarship and academia um, with a second career, of course, in the world of politics um, and statesmanship. The Wilson Center tries to um, commemorate uh, these two ideals of sound scholarship and sound uh, policy. Um, and I think you will agree that today's program uh, is very much an example of uh, both of these. Um, we are hosting a book launch today by a member of the Wilson Center family, as it were. Uh, Rajiv Chandra Sakharan has twice been a visiting scholar here, uh, most recently last year when he wrote large portions of the book that we're talking about today, Little America, The War Within the War for Afghanistan. Um, an earlier tenure here, he wrote um, another highly regarded, highly respected book, Imperial Life in the Emerald City, uh, which is a, was about the American adventure in Iraq, uh, and which was, among other awards, was a finalist for the 2006 National Book Awards for nonfiction. Uh, this book is, if anything, even better, and Rajiv, we expect uh, similar accolades uh, as the awards come out in the months ahead. Uh, when Rajiv is not at the Wilson Center, um, occasionally we will share him with the Washington Post, where he is a senior correspondent and associate editor. Um, he's been at the Post for almost 20 years now. Uh, originally, he was from the San Francisco Bay Area, studied at Stanford. We will, um, at the end of this uh, session, uh, be having a reception in the hall immediately afterwards where you will have an opportunity uh, to buy the book if you haven't already done so, and I see a number of you have, um, and uh, to get Rajiv to sign it. Uh, and if there's too long a line for him to sign it, well, you'll just have to pick up a glass of wine and an order while you're waiting. Uh, so we'll stretch this out as long as you are prepared to buy books. Uh, finally, let me say that um, this, is, this event today is a joint enterprise not only of the Asia program, which I run, uh, but also of the International Studies program uh, run by my uh, colleague, uh, Rob Litvak, there in the back. Um, and the Middle East program uh, run by my other colleague, Hale Esfandiare, uh, also sitting in the back. Um, I think the three of us, our three programs, uh, frequently collaborate. I don't know whether that's because our three programs represent parts of the world where the biggest headaches are simply the most exciting stories. Uh, but anyway, uh, Rajiv, uh, we thank you for giving uh, me an opportunity to <coughs> collaborate with Rob and Hale once again. Now I invite you to come to the podium. Well, thanks for that kind introduction, and thank you and to, to Rob and Holly for putting on uh, the event uh, today. Uh, I, I had a very meaningful five months here at the Wilson Center where I, as you note correctly, worked on and wrote large sections of this book. Um, it, it may not be as good as the first one, only because you guys gave me this time an office with a window, so I had a little bit of distraction as opposed to the last time where I was. We'll, we'll locked remember in, not to give you a window next time. I, I was locked in a in a windowless cubby, but it was uh, it was, was it provided me with the uh, appropriate writing karma. Anyway, I, I regard the center as, as a wonderful oasis of thoughtful 
scholarship and research in, in our increasingly uh, hyper-partisan capital. And so it was, it was a real uh, refreshing break from, from the, the, my travels to Afghanistan and, and my time here in Washington to be able to ensconce myself here for five months and, and work on this. So I'm, I'm deeply grateful to the Wilson Center. But um, while I wrote my book here, you know, I have to sit, confess, you know, I really didn't want to write this particular book. When I, when I set out for my first trip to Afghanistan in early 2009, I assumed that if there was a book to be written about Afghanistan in these recent years, it would be about how President Obama and his national security team managed to reverse years of strategic drift and neglect and turn around a failing war, how they you know, snatched victory from the proverbial jaws of defeat. After spending two years in Iraq in 2003 and 2004, watching President Bush's, Mar pardon me, watching President Bush's merry band of neocon political appointees, many of them inexperienced 20-somethings, chosen more for political fidelity than their nation-building expertise. You know, back then, they used to ask them at hiring interviews at the Pentagon what their views on Roe versus Wade and capital punishment were. Um, I expected Team Obama to show us what can happen when the pros are put in charge. I wasn't thinking we'd get peace a la Germany or Japan after World War II or the Jeffersonian democracy that the neocons so foolishly thought they could birth in Iraq, but I was hopeful that the United States and its NATO allies could return Afghanistan to where it was in late 2001 and early 2002 when the Taliban were on the run and a brighter future seemed a certainty. When I was on that first trip to Afghanistan in early 2009, President Obama decided to send an additional 17,000 troops to the war front. For Obama, Afghanistan had been the good war, the war that began with two fallen towers, not the war that was a result of faulty WMD and bad intelligence, or pardon me, exaggerated claims of WMD and, and bad intelligence. In, in August 2007, then Senator Obama had declared Afghanistan the war that has to be won. He pledged to deploy more forces, increase reconstruction aid, and promised not to repeat the mistakes of the past when we turned our backs on Afghanistan. Back then, Obama's and his, his and his advisors assumed that the 17,000 would satisfy the Pentagon. Soon after approving the new troops, the president signed off on a strategy document that was supposed to guide the Pentagon in the use of those troops and those already on the ground. The president made very clear that his aims in Afghanistan and Pakistan were to be clear and focused, to disrupt, dismantle, and defeat al-Qaeda in both of those nations. But the plan he approved to achieve that goal was expansive. Instead of focusing solely on killing or capturing al-Qaeda leaders, the new White House plan envisaged building an Afghan state that would be strong and stable enough to keep al-Qaeda leaders from returning to, the, to Afghanistan from sanctuaries in Pakistan. And that involved doing what the Americans should have done back in 2001, building an Afghan government, training a new Afghan army, providing essential services to the Afghan population. <laughs> But with the Taliban in control of large swaths of the country, pulling that off in 2009 wasn't going to be nearly as easy as it could have been eight years earlier. To do so, the military believed it needed to implement a counterinsurgency strategy. COIN, as the military calls it, concentrates not on hunting down guerrillas, but on protecting the civilian population from insurgents. The idea is to separate the good from the bad and focus on the good. But COIN requires lots of resources and lots of time. Protecting civilians means ensuring law and order, providing basic services such as education and health care, setting up government operations, mentoring local security forces, and rebuilding infrastructure. It sounded ambitious, and it sure was. But Afghanistan was the good war, and the price tag didn't seem all that high. Obama thought he had already paid for most of it with the 17,000 troops that he had approved. Of course, as you all know, that wasn't enough for the military. The new top military commander in Kabul, General Stan McChrystal, soon asked the president for 40,000 more troops. In an assessment he sent the president shortly after taking command, McChrystal warned that if NATO forces fail to reverse Taliban momentum within 12 months, defeating the insurgency might no longer be possible. The status quo, he told Obama, will lead to failure. McChrystal's request led to sticker shock in the White House. All of a sudden, the coin strategy that the president had so quickly approved a few months earlier had a new price tag, more than 100,000 total U.S. troops on the ground. The president convened a series of lengthy discussions with his war cabinet to discuss McChrystal's request. In those discussions, those in uniform, McChrystal, 
Admiral Mike Mullen, then the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and General Dave Petraeus, who was then the Chief of the U.S. Central Command, strongly supported more forces on the ground. They believed that Coyne had turned Iraq around, despite uh, plenty of evidence that the reasons for the turnaround in Iraq, if you even want to call it a turnaround, but we should say the diminution of violence from the peak during the Civil War there, was due to a complex set of factors, not simply the addition of more U.S. forces. But the military argued that Coyne had worked successfully in Iraq and would work in Afghanistan. But in Afghanistan, Coyne did not simply involve separating warring parties in a civil war, but something far more challenging, trying to convince the ethnic Pashtun population to cast their lot with President Hamid Karzai's government instead of with the insurgency. The problem was that Karzai's administration was often more rapacious and corrupt than the Taliban. How would coin work when the locals were turning to the insurgents to protect them from their supposed protectors? Coin also required patience. It can take years before a besieged population feels safe enough to demonstrate allegiance to their nation. But the commanders downplayed those risks and costs. The civilians in the war cabinet weren't sold on the McChrystal plan. Chief among them was Vice President Biden, who doubted President Karzai's sincerity, and questioned whether the Pakistani government would be truly supportive of a more expansive coin campaign. Instead, he argued, the military should focus more of its existing resources in the country on pursuing Taliban leaders and any al-Qaeda operatives stupid enough to sneak back into Afghanistan from Pakistan. In discussions in the White House Situation Room, Biden emerged as the most vocal skeptic of coin. Unmoved by McChrystal, Petraeus's, and Mullen's claims, he kept questioning the rationale for additional forces. In my reporting for this book, I obtained a memo that Biden sent directly to President Obama, spelling out his concerns about the military's principal justification for more troops. The memo had not been revealed before. It's in the book. Let me read it to you. I do not see how anyone who took part in our discussions could emerge without profound questions about the viability of counterinsurgency. Our military will do its part. They will clear anything we ask them to clear. They will hold anything we ask them to hold. But no one can tell you with conviction when and even if the flip sides of coin that are required to build and transfer responsibility to the Afghans, an effective and sustainable civilian surge, a credible partner in Kabul, basic governance and services, and compen pardon me, competent Afghan security forces. We simply can't control these variables yet they're essential to the success of COIN. In the end, Obama sided with his commanders. He decided to give them almost all of what they wanted, 30,000 more troops, although the surge did come with conditions. The most significant of those, as we know, was that U.S. forces would start coming home in 2011, a deadline the president took from the military's own planning documents that stated that U.S. troops could clear areas of insurgents and then transfer responsibility for them to the Afghan security forces in just 18 to 24 months. A month later, in January 2010, I was preparing to accompany the first wave of surge troops as they assaulted a Taliban stronghold in southern Afghanistan called Marja. It was a nasty place. There were hundreds of insurgents holed up there. They had set up dozens of bomb-making factories. Many of the farms in the area grew opium-producing poppies, the sales of which helped to fund the insurgency. As my office here in D.C., as I looked at a Google Earth image of Marja, I noticed something fascinating. North-South irrigation canals, razor sharp as the avenues of Manhattan. In a land of mud brick homes and farm plots with meandering borders that clearly were demarcated without the aid of any surveyor, these canals struck me as odd. Somebody else had to have built them, but who? Now, it wasn't hard to find the answer. It was in the Library of Congress, the National Archives, and just across the way at the files at the US Agency for International Development. And I should say, lots of it was on the internet. It was a story suffused with relevant lessons for our latest attempt at nation building, but few in Washington seem to have bothered to read about it or connect the dots. It's a story that begins quite remarkably with the Holocaust. As the Nazis forced Jewish fur traders to shut their businesses in Europe, many of those able to flee resettled in New York. And once they got to our country, they needed new sources for pelts to make coats and hats. They turned to Afghanistan, remarkably of all places, whose hills abounded with the Persian fat-tailed sheep. The newborn fur of those sheep could be turned into lustrous coats and hats. 
And in the 1930s and in the early 1940s, Afghanistan exported between one and two million caracol pelts a year to the United States. Because of currency exchange controls, the sales of each pelt put a few more dollars in the Afghan king's treasury. So at the end of World War II, when Europe was digging out of rubble, Afghanistan was sitting on a comparative windfall. Back then, it was a lot of money, $100 million in gold and foreign exchange reserves, sitting in the king's treasury in Kabul. And so the young king there, Muhammad Zahir Shah, just 32 years old, had been very impressed with what the United States had done during the Great Depression in the Tennessee Valley. And he thought he'd like to do something like that for his country. So he hired the American engineering firm, Morrison Knudsen, that had built the Hoover Dam and the San Francisco Bay Bridge. And he hired them with our, his own money, this was not an aid project, hired them to come to Afghanistan, to the southern Afghanistan, to the Helmand River Valley, and turn a barren desert into what he hoped would be a verdant agricultural oasis, a veritable breadbasket for his country, to give Afghanistan food self, agricultural self-sufficiency, to ease the pain of frequent food shortages, and vault his primitive landlocked nation into the modern era. There was another reason afoot, uh, driven by some of the king's closest advisors. Some of them in the late, in the, in the 30s, had, had spent a few years studying in the United States on, on royal scholarships. And they wanted to bring the Afghanistan, pardon me, pardon me, they wanted to bring the America that had dazzled them in their school days to Afghanistan. They envisioned that this project would be more than just about agricultural development. They saw it as an opportunity to build new villages with modern schools and health clinics, to resettle nomads, and to house families from different tribes together next to each other as opposed to in separate villages. They would educate girls and get women to cast off the head-to-toe burqa. Professional government men from Kabul would supplant the gray-bearded elders who wielded power in the, in the provinces. Eye for an eye Islamic justice would be replaced with written laws and august courts. It's going to be a grand social engineering experiment. And these English-speaking, suit-wearing Afghans who had the king's ear saw in these American engineers from Morrison Knudsen the ideal partners to transform their nation. But unfortunately, this grand vision soon ran aground. On the agriculture side, a study conducted by Morrison Knudsen found that the soil in the Helmand River Valley was relatively shallow and saline and below it was an almost impermeable layer of subsoil crust. Think of the Helmand River Valley as a giant planter box without drainage holes. When irrigated by the Afghans who have a tendency to flood their land, water pooled on the surface. And when that water evaporated, it left salts in the soil that stunted anything that grew there. So the royal government developed concerns about this project. Well, the American answer was simply to expand. Morrison Knudsen said, ah, you should just dig more canals, build a dam and a reservoir in the upper river hills. Sure, it would cost more, but the king had money, so they said, sure, why not? Of course, it was standard to do sort of soil and drainage studies, but the Afghan government blew it off, and Morrison Knudsen wasn't one to object. Everyone thought the project was simply too big to fail, but it wasn't. Soon, these new settlers wound up living in tents, not in these wonderfully planned communities. They wind up building their own mud-walled homes and watching their fields turn into marshes. The American engineers initially were sleeping in camps as well, but they wanted a comfortable place to live. So they decided to build themselves their own town. They also saw this town as part of the grand social engineering experiment. They figured once the Afghans saw how they would live, or they were living, they the Afghans would aspire to create similar communities for themselves. So they built this little town. Eight square blocks initially, with perpendicular streets, white stucco bungalows, manicured green front lawns. If any of you have traveled to Afghanistan, you know, or seen pictures in National Geographic, you'll see that you know almost every house in that country is surrounded by tall mud or brick walls. In this little place, there were no walls. Neighbors could see each other through their front windows. They built the country's first and only co-ed high school. They set up a co-ed swimming pool and tennis courts. They, uh, they built a nice clubhouse where a bartender would pour gin and tonics at night. There were evening card games and weekly square dances. Uh, everyone, you know, there were, kids would listen to Elvis Presley and the Everly Brothers on uh, 45 RPM uh, uh, records, and uh, adults would throw dinner parties where everyone got tipsy. The Americans called the town by its official name, 
Lashkar Gah. It was designed, the town was designed by the Americans. In fact, while I was working on the book at the Wilson Center, I, I got from the Library of Congress the actual blueprints for this town, and it spells out just how wide the streets are supposed to be, what type of trees are supposed to line the streets, and it specified all the buildings that were supposed to be constructed there. Of course, the Americans gave it a name, Lashkar Gah, uh, which is what it's called today by the Afghans. It's the capital of Helmand province. But back then, as the Afghans looked at this sort of otherworldly slice of Americana that had been dropped into the desert, they came up with a different name for it, Little America. Now, outside the town, as, as, as the irrigation project started to, to get increasingly troubled, um, the Afghan government ended its contracts with Morris and Knudsen. But the U.S. government couldn't afford to let this project just simply go to the birds. It felt that if, if, if that happened, the Soviets, which were already active in northern Afghanistan, would swoop down to the south, take over the project. It would be both an embarrassment for Washington, but also expand Soviet influence into southern Afghanistan, which up till that point had been largely dominated by, by, by the United States. So the job to fix all of this went to USAID in 1961, uh, uh, soon after it was created by President Kennedy, and it became one of USAID's largest, pardon me, overseas ventures. And aid specialists uh, soon discovered a fatal flaw in the design of the project. The main canal was built too low, which forced Afghan farmers to essentially flood their fields, which weren't necessarily flat, and there weren't proper drainage canals that had been built. So eight engineers came up uh, working with the Bureau of Reclamation, which, is, which had done a lot of work in the American Southwest. They came up with a plan. They were going to bring in bulldozers, flatten the land, or move the Afghans off their land, excuse me, flatten the land, bring the Afghans back. It sounded very nice, except the Afghans were worried that if they left their land, they'd never get it back. So when the eight bulldozers showed up, the Afghans met the bulldozers with rifles. This began a years-long process of failed attempts to try to fix this project. Uh, lots of different uh, approaches tried, nothing really worked. And by July 1974, funding ran out, project ended. Then a few months later, Henry Kissinger, then Secretary of State, paid a visit to Kabul. And the Afghan Prime Minister complained to him that the Helmand River project was an unfinished symphony and urged Kissinger to try to fix it. So when Kissinger came back to Washington, he, he urged the bureaucracy to try to make another go at it. And this time, the work went to a sort of a tiny federal agency called the U.S. Soil Conservation Service. And they came up with a solution, maddeningly, blindingly simple. Simply dig more drainage canals, have the Afghans do it, don't bring in bulldozers, give them hand tools, employ people, get them to do it themselves. And on the first farms they did this on, yields increased by 75%. But then something else happened. There was a sour revolution, Soviet tanks rolled in, by then, Every American had left Little America, and the project could not be expanded. We'd finally, after decades, found a viable strategy in Little America, but it was too late. Now, had senior officials at the White House and the Pentagon and the State Department, AID, bothered to fully understand this history back in 2009, I believe it might have given them a little bit of pause in advocating another grand attempt at nation building in Afghanistan. But instead, we barreled forward with a strategy that had a minuscule chance of working. In my book, I dissect the American approach to stabilizing Afghanistan on two levels. The first is strategically. That is, was the coin strategy and the surge the right decision? The second is operationally. Once the president signed off on the coin strategy and the surge, how well did the organs of our government, the Pentagon, the State Department, AID, and even his own White House, how well did they implement his policy? Let's start with strategy. And let me state up front that I believe coin can work if the conditions are right and the cost is merited. But for coin to have prevailed in Afghanistan, several things needed to occur. The Afghan government had to be a willing partner. The Pakistani government had to crack down on insurgent sanctuaries on its soil. And the US government had to be willing to commit troops and money for several years. The American people had to be patient enough for security to improve gradually and finally, the Afghan army had to be ready and willing to assume control of areas that had been cleared of insurgents by American troops. Coin failed on all of those fronts. First, let's talk about the Afghan government. President Karzai never agreed with America's war strategy. American military officers and diplomats argue correctly, I should note, that tribal rivalries and inequitable distribution of power at the local level 
and the Afghan government's failure to provide even the most basic services are all key factors that push many Afghans into the arms of the Taliban. But in Karzai's eyes, the principal problem isn't any of that stuff. It's not corruption or the malfeasance of his government. He sees the problem as being the infiltration of militants from neighboring Pakistan. And he's long wanted the United States and NATO to focus the bulk of their forces on the border. By mucking around in the districts of Kandahar and Helmand at the village and district level, he believes the US and its coalition partners are simply disrupting what he sees as a natural system of self-regulating ethnic Pashtun governance. As a senior military official told me, through all of his flare-ups, Karzai is sending us a message. And that message is, I don't believe in counterinsurgency. The Afghan people had a different reason to be skeptical of coin. Contrary to the images we see on television here, most Afghans have no great love for the Taliban. They view the Talibs as the religious zealots that they are. And the Afghan people know very well what it was like to live under the oppressive regime of the Taliban. But you know what? They have no great love for their own government either. That's because Karzai's government's filled with a bunch of thugs, warlords, and corrupt scoundrels. They abuse the people, shake them down for bribes, and kidnap boys for pleasure. When American troops told the Afghans that their mission was, was not just to improve security, but to bring the government to these remote villages and valleys, many residents recoiled. Whoa, they said, we may not like the Taliban, but we don't like our government either. And that was a key point Washington failed to grasp until too late. And the Pakistani government? You know, after the Taliban leadership relocated to Pakistan in late 2001, they were provided safe harbor by Pakistan's intelligence service, the ISI. Talibs were allowed to meet and reorganize and, and even establish informal networks inside Afghanistan. But back then, Pakistani spies refrained from giving them overt assistance. Although ISI officials regularly met with a handful of senior Talib mullahs, Taliban commanders had to raise their own capital from drug trafficking and foreign donations, and they had to acquire their own munitions which wasn't all that difficult to do in Pakistan. But in mid-2009, as American surge forces began flooding into southern Afghanistan, the ISI adopted a far more hands-on strategy. Concerned that US gains on the battlefield would hobble the Afghan insurgency, ISI spy masters began interacting far more directly with Taliban commanders, often providing them with arms and intelligence via civilian intermediaries. According to one assessment, at least half of all insurgent commanders were working closely with ISI operatives by the spring of 2011. Now there's the issue of the price tag. Was it worth it? You know, it costs a million dollars to keep one American service member in Afghanistan for one year. That meant the annual bill for the war last year was about $100 billion. Is achieving a marginally less bad outcome in Afghanistan worth the expense with other pressing security challenges, Iran, North Korea, the political upheaval in the Middle East? Is it prudent to be tying up so many forces and dispersing so many precious dollars in remote Afghan villages? And then there's a the question of American patience, which the surge and the broader coin strategy seems to have exhausted. The war was in its eighth year when Obama decided to surge. Even though many Americans shared the president's view that Afghanistan was the good war, only a slim majority thought the decision to send more troops was wise. Although commanders in chief should not use polls to guide strategic decisions, Public support is essential for any drawn-out campaign involving tens of thousands of troops, hundreds of monthly casualties, and almost daily fatalities. Had all the other factors played out differently? Had Karzai been a true partner? Had the Pakistanis taken meaningful action against the Taliban? Had our nation not been in the throes of economic stagnation? Then perhaps the public could have rallied around such a large war effort. But when all those indicators pointed down, public opinion soon followed. Now, even a majority of Republicans believe the war is no longer worth fighting. And lastly, the question of the Afghan army. Instead of compelling Afghan soldiers into action, the surge, in my view, sent the opposite message. The Afghans often decided to hang back and let the Americans do the fighting. What was supposed to be a kick in the pants, or at least a golden opportunity to work in tandem with the Americans, turned into a crutch. But lest you think I'm all about the negative, the Afghan army has emerged as a rare bright spot in this overall effort. As American troops have started to leave, the Afghans are stepping up to shoulder more of the fighting. And through it all, the Afghan army remains the country's mo one of the country's most, perhaps the country's most respected institution. If the country hangs together after American combat forces depart in 2014, it's going to be because of the Afghan army. So what should the president have done back in 2009? Well, I'm not one of those who thinks that we should have just packed up and left. Had we done that, 
it likely would have condemned the Afghans to the hell of a prolonged insurgency or another civil war. We still have a moral obligation to the Afghan people. When we launched the war in 2001, we made an implicit promise to them that if they stood with us against the Taliban, we'd give them a shot at a better, freer life. But that didn't require a coin strategy and a surge that tired us out. One of the main characters in my book, a State Department officer named Cale Weston, who spent seven years in Iraq and Afghanistan, that's more time than any other US diplomat spent in the war zones. He argued that instead of going big or going home, we should have gone long. The president needed to determine how many troops he was willing to commit to Afghanistan, in Cale's view for 10 years or more, then he needed to pledge that level of support to the Af Afghan people. That would have meant no surge, would have meant fewer troops than were deployed even when Obama took office. But Cale Weston was convinced that a smaller but enduring force would be smarter on all fronts. It would appeal to the Afghans, who chafed at the presence of so many foreign soldiers on their soil. It would compel the Afghan army to more quickly assume responsibility for fighting the Taliban and securing the population. And it would force the Americans to focus on only the most essential missions instead of grand nation-building projects. Afghanistan, he often said, is a marathon, not a sprint. The surge was a sprint and we Americans got winded too quickly. Despite all the coin assumptions that turned out to be false, our troops have made remarkable progress in the past three years. Parts of southern Afghanistan that were once teeming with insurgents are now largely peaceful. Schools have reopened, as have bazaars. People are living as close to a normal life as possible in some areas. But Afghanistan as a whole is still far from secure. Eastern parts of the country are still in the grips of a Taliban faction backed by the Pakistani intelligence service. And in the South, where there have been great improvements, a critical question lingers. Will the Afghans, will their government, their army, their police force, will they have the willingness and ability to take the baton from American troops as they begin coming home this summer? Will the Afghans sustain the gains? Will all of the blood and treasure we have expended been worth it? Or will it slip back to chaos? For all the reasons I've outlined, I believe there's ample reason to worry that much of what we've accomplished will not last. That doesn't mean the Talibs will be able to roll into Kabul with the same ease as they did in the 1990s. I don't think the Kabul government's going to fall as Saigon's did. The Afghan army, it appears, should be able to protect major cities and other critical areas. But the insurgents almost certainly will expand control of rural districts, and they'll retain the ability to conduct frequent attacks against government and civilian targets. The foreseeable future will be messy and chaotic. But many Americans may well see it as good enough. Osama's dead, Al-Qaeda's on the ropes, the Talib leadership's taken a beating. Could all that have occurred without a surge? Could we have achieved a similar messy but good enough outcome without hundreds more dead Americans and thousands more gravely wounded? Before I take your questions, I want to turn to the, to the matter of how the surge was executed. I've talked about the strategic disconnect. Now I want to address the operational failure. Agree or disagree, the surge was the president's strategy. And the government beneath him, the military and civilian agencies, had an obligation to make their best efforts to implement it. But each part of our government made critical errors. First off, the Pentagon. We sent too many troops to the wrong places. Instead of focusing in that initial year of the troop uplift in 2009 on Kandahar, the country's second largest city, the, the spiritual capital for the Taliban, the, the, the place that if the Talibs managed to seize, which was clearly in their sights, if they seized it, they'd have a springboard to take over much of the rest of the nation as they did in the 1990s. Instead of focusing on Kandahar City and the immediate environs, the bulk of the first wave of additional forces of that 17,000 comprised a marine brigade. We sent them off to neighboring Helmand province which is home to far, far fewer people. We actually sent them to a part of Afghanistan that was home to about 1% of the population. Why? Tribal rivalries, not in Afghanistan, but in the Pentagon. The US Marine Corps, which wanted to fight with its own helicopters, its own logistics units, didn't want to operate side by side with the US Army and the Canadian Army in Kandahar. It would be too complicated to have their own airspace, their own what they called battle space. So they demanded sort of a contiguous area to fight in, essentially their own patch of the sandbox. And the only place that could be carved out and given to them was a part of Helmand that was home to relatively few people. It meant that we essentially wasted an entire year before we got a meaningful number of troops into the key districts around Kandahar. The civilian search, diplomats and reconstruction workers, that was supposed to occur in tandem with the militaries, but it too was plagued with problems. 
um, most of the new civilian arrivals wind up staying in Kabul. By late 2010, more than two-thirds of the 1,100 U.S. government civilian employees in Afghanistan were stationed in Kabul to feed a mushrooming bureaucracy at the embassy and the USAID mission. Although there were plenty of Afghans in the city with whom to collaborate, many embassy and aid staffers were required to sit at their desks and perform tasks they could have just as easily done here in Washington. Now, let me just state up front that there were lots of talented and dedicated people who went to Afghanistan for the State Department, AID, and other federal agencies, and I'm sure some of you are in the crowd today. But I should note that from the outset, the civilian surge was also bedeviled by a lack of initiative and creativity back here in DC among those doing the hiring. Instead of scouring the country for top talent to fill these crucial, well-paying jobs that were a key element of the president's national security agenda, those responsible for hiring turned to state and aid officers in other parts of the world, but a lot of them had already served in Iraq or Afghanistan. So the personnel office sought out retirees, resulted in, for instance, a 79-year-old man getting sent to the reconstruction team office in Kandahar. Aid and state eventually agreed to hire outsiders for year-long tours in Afghanistan. But instead of calling up experts in the private sector, universities, or nonprofit organizations, it simply waited, in many cases, for resumes to come in over the transom. Many were from contractors who had worked in Iraq, often on wasteful projects that had accomplished little. The result was almost as embarrassing as the first year of the Iraq occupation, when the CPA had given a 24-year-old who had never worked in finance the job of reopening Baghdad Stock Exchange. One USAID field officer sent to Helmand was reassigned after she got into a fight with the Marines because they wouldn't give her an air-conditioned trailer. In Nawa District, which was one of the safest in Helmand province, it simply couldn't hold down a State Department rep. The first one went on leave and never returned. The second one also did the same thing, but not before revealing to colleagues that he didn't know what the most commonly used acronym for the Afghan security forces was. The third one stayed, but he had been fired from his previous job as a town manager in Virginia. Um, our friends over at USAID put too much money into the country. Um, Afghanistan had been starved of reconstruction assistance during the Bush administration. Think of Afghanistan as a, as a you know, parched guy on a hot day, but instead of giving him a, a tall glass of cold water, we sort of turned a fire hose on Afghanistan. Um, far more water than the parched man could drink and sort of wounding him in the process. Uh, in 2010, we tried to spend more than $4 billion in the country in one year on development projects. In one district of Helmand, that equated to more per person than the annual per capita income. Not surprisingly, the cash surge wound up exacerbating the very corruption we were trying to reduce. And the President's War Cabinet was often, too often at war with itself. And one of the biggest, nastiest internal fights that I detail in this book was between Richard Holbrooke and the President's top White House aides. Holbrooke had been appointed by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton to be our point man for Afghanistan. His job was try to try to chart a path to eventual peace talks with the Taliban. And he was eminently qualified to do so. He had more experience with war and peace than anyone else in the upper reaches of the administration. Just at, at age 27, he had served on the Paris peace talks uh, at, aimed at ending the, the Vietnam War. In 1996, he brokered the Dayton Accords that ended fighting in the Balkans. The hope was that he could do something similar for Afghanistan. But instead of drawing on Holbrooke's expertise and supporting his push for reconciliation with the Taliban, some White House officials chose instead to dwell on his shortcomings, his disorganization, his manic intensity, his thirst for the spotlight, his giant ego, his dislike for President Karzai, and his tendency to badger fellow senior officials. The president could have ordered a stop to this infighting, but he remained hands off, even though he too favored a negotiated end to the war. His sympathies, if anything, lay with his fellow White House staffers. Holbrooke's frenetic behavior was the antithesis of Obama's no drama rule. So the president kept his distance. He never granted Holbrooke a one-on-one -on -one session in the Oval Office. And when he traveled to Afghanistan in March 2010, he took more than a dozen staffers, but not Richard Holbrooke, who wasn't even informed of the trip in advance. During the sit room's discussions to discuss McChrystal's um, request for more forces in 2009, Obama kept his views on surging to himself, but he was far less sphinx-like about, about Holbrooke. At one point when Holbrooke gravely compared the challenge and the, the, that, that Obama faced at that moment to what LBJ had to grapple with during the Vietnam War, the president cut him off. Richard, Obama said, do people really talk like that? That infighting exacted a staggering cost. The Obama White House failed to aggressively explore negotiations to end the war when it had the most boots on the battlefield. All that said, this still comes back to grand strategy, 
Had Obama have gone long instead of big, it would have forced the Afghans to do more for themselves, and it would have led the Americans to pursue more modest and sustainable initiatives. Fewer troops could have meant fewer bureaucratic obstacles and turf battles. Less could have been more. But taking that path would have required a first-term Democratic president with no military experience, who had promised during his campaign to fix Afghanistan, to stand up to his troop-hungry generals. Although far more Americans perished on the beaches of Normandy and in the jungles of Vietnam, Afghanistan stands alone in the annals of American warfare. It's the country's longest war. It's a forgotten war. With no draft, the fighting has been left to a small cadre of professional officers and volunteer grunts. And it's by far the most complicated war our nation has prosecuted. Troops have been told to befriend villagers and bombard insurgents with the same fervor, often in the same day. Commanders have been ordered to fight with fewer forces and in less time than they wanted. Diplomats and development experts have been required to work in environments that were more dangerous than they had signed up for. All told, I spent three years observing Americans attempting to defeat the insurgency in Afghanistan. For a long time, I believed we could pull it off if only we had enough people, money, and patience. But the real challenge wasn't headcounts, budgets, or public opinion. For all the grand pronouncements about waging a new kind of war, our nation was unable to adapt. Too few generals recognized that surging forces could be counterproductive, that the presence of more foreign troops in the Pashtun heartland would be a potent recruiting tool for the Taliban. Too few soldiers were ordered to leave their air-conditioned bases with Baskin-Robbins ice cream and big-screen televisions in the rec rooms. Too few diplomats invested the effort to understand the languages and the cultures of the places in which they were stationed. Too few development experts were interested in anything other than making a buck. Too few officials in Washington were willing to assume the risks necessary to forge a lasting peace. And nobody, it seemed, wanted to work together. The good war had turned bad. For years, we dwelled on the limitations of the Afghans. We should have focused on ours. Thank you. All right, Jave, you have managed to profoundly depress me. <laughs> Even though I knew what was coming, um, it's a powerful story. Um, you tell it's an important story, um, and it's a story I think that has to be told. Not everyone will agree with all parts of it, um, but um, you persuasively uh, make your case. Before I uh, open it up to questioning, let me ask you uh, one question which is both historical but also uh, looking toward the future. Was there, um, let's just say since uh, 2009, mm -hmm. the period you focused on, was there ever a realistic chance or is there today or in the foreseeable future a realistic chance of serious, fruitful negotiations with the Taliban that would lead to a Taliban good enough, not only for us, but also for our friends in Afghanistan? I think the chances were always very, very slim. Uh, certainly slimmer today than they, they were back in 2010, when we had a little bit more leverage, when troops were flowing in as opposed to flowing out. But it's not like the Talibs were sitting across from a negotiating table waiting for uh, U.S. Uh, uh, envoys and interlocutors to show up. Uh, it was always going to be a very complicated path to try to get there. I mean, look, the Taliban has no mailing address, no, you know, defined political leadership, um, no, no specific, you know, uh, asks uh, save for things that are, you know, so beyond the pale that you know it wouldn't fly with, with the, the majority of Afghans who who, who don't believe in the Taliban. Um, but might there have been a way to have peeled off certain large factions of the Taliban? Um, and perhaps, um, so what, what I'm arguing here, or, or I, let, me, let me rephrase that, I'm not arguing, I'm, I'm reporting. What I'm, what I'm describing here is not an opportunity where you had the other side ready, ready to go, but you had a, uh, an administration where at, at senior levels there was a belief that this was a, 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 a reasonable, um, uh, th th this, th this merited exploration. This was, you know, a hoped-for outcome. But those who should have been working on it together were not always rowing in the same direction. And I didn't even get into the civ mill disconnects, which I spell out in the book on how, 
you know, the Stan McChrystal was warming to the idea when he was fired and Dave Petraeus came in, he essentially uh, put the kibosh on it. There's a, there's a great line I have in the book when Holbrook goes up and tries to talk to Petraeus in Kabul about reconciliation, and, and Petraeus says to Holbrook, uh, Dave, that's a 15-second conversation. Yeah, yes, maybe at some point, but no, not now, and essentially cuts him off, um, at least on that particular issue. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, gonna recognize people. If you will wait till the microphone gets to you, if you'll stand so that everybody can hear you, uh, briefly uh, identify yourself and keep your question and or qu uh, statement reasonably s short. We'll start right here. You want me to get up as well? Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you, Rajiv, for such a dense presentation. Would you also complain about the NATO forces and the PRTs, please? Uh, complain or, co or comment? <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, uh, this book has, um, uh, th there are sections in it that, that address the relationship between uh, U.S. and British forces, a little bit of discussion about Canadian forces in Kandahar. Um, the purpose of my examination was to look at how um, the U.S. government, particularly the current administration, went about dealing with Afghanistan from early 2009 on. Uh, and I focused on the South because that's where the bulk of the um, surge forces were sent. Uh, and it's also where we had done all this, this other remarkable stuff six decades earlier. So I, I deliberately excluded a systematic examination of um, how uh, other NATO members beyond those who were in the South and other PRTs were operating. Um, but it is fair to say that, that Afghans have some very similar concerns about PRT operations and operations of NATO forces in, in other parts of the country. Um, I do look, though, at, at some of the, the tensions between, for instance, the British-run PRT in Helmand and U.S. forces there, where um, uh, U.S. Marines were intent on pushing into parts of the province, for instance, where there were fewer people than even the initial places that they went. Uh, in one case, an abandoned town up in, up in northern Helmand, which I write about in the prologue. Um, and the PRT, which was British-run, did not think this was a very wise idea and did not want to expend resources there. And there was a great degree of, 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 of tension there between the two governments over, over that issue and, and over a number of other issues related to the stabilization of the South. And there were, there were, sm there were less tensions, but there was also some friction in, uh, in Kandahar between the Canadians and the Americans. John? Uh, thank you. Uh, Donald Camp with CSIS, and full disclosure, formerly with State Department and NSC staff. Um, you've written a fascinating book about the American role in the 1950s and since 9-11, and to be fair, that was what you set out to do, but a lot happened in Afghanistan in the 80s and 90s that I think is perhaps relevant to your thesis. Uh, one anecdote you describe in your book is a Marine going into a village and being spoken to in Russian because they had just assumed that a white foreigner would be a Russian. Uh, and, and the whole Soviet incursion and occupation um, has a few parallels. And it, including in Helmand, where, among other things, they did rural development. They had their own PRTs. Um, yet they obviously had a much harsher side, and what people remember in the villages is the black helicopters and the shelling and so forth. It seems to me that one of the Taliban's s strongest suits is fear of a permanent foreign presence in Afghanistan. And so um, I guess my question to you is, how uh, how do you see that as, as sort of uh, the danger for the future, that, that the Taliban will, will reinforce itself by uh, you know, the sense that the Americans are there to stay and here are these foreign occupiers. That, is that a main component of the Taliban message at this point? It's a, it's a great question and, and a great point. Um, you know, truth be told, had I gotten into all that stuff, my, my book would be as thick as Peter Thompson's wonderful work. Uh, I, I just unfortunately could not get so long of a leave of absence from the Post to do that, nor am I uh, you know, as esteemed a scholar as he and others who have, who have done uh, great works of, of history in Afghanistan uh, are. But I do try to get into um, 
before I get to the, the permanent occupation bit, um, uh, the, the, the Soviet years as it relates to Helmand from the point of view of uh, from uh, poppy cultivation and so forth, how um, uh, a, 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 a relative of the, the first post 9-11 governor of Helmand essentially was the one who issued the fatwa that legalized poppy cultivation, how they, how the, the poppy barons essentially um, uh, copied a business model used by the Afghan government to promote the growth of cotton in the South um, as a way to encourage farmers to grow poppy. Uh, and then, of course, post 9-11, the Afghans said, can you help us with cotton? And uh, our friends over at AID said, uh, no, because there's this thing called the Bumpers Amendment that prevents us from helping another country's cotton industry, and nobody wanted to go and get a waiver to it. And so the one crop that they want to grow in the South, we don't, we don't help them with, and we instead try to get them to grow things they don't want to grow. That's an aside. Um, but the, certainly, the, that was one, another big um, flaw in the coin strategy. In sending more forces down to, the, to these districts, it played right into Taliban propaganda of, of either permanent occupation or sort of endless uh, foreign presence on our soil. Um, and this is where, in some cases, you know, smaller is, is not just more nimble, but, but is, is in some ways more in, you know, in keeping with Afghan sensibilities. And you know, it also gets to the question of economies of violence, that as you sort of bring in more troops, do you then encourage sort of insurgent commanders to go into those areas with, with money and munitions in ways they wouldn't otherwise do. How much of this becomes, in some, some ways, a self-fulfilling, uh, or there's self-fulfilling elements to all of it, as opposed to sort of going in and dealing with, with sort of a pre-existing problem. And, uh, you know, I, d I do think as, as, as people go and, 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 and further examine sort of violence trends, and map them to troop deployments at local levels, I mean, you, you see interesting sort of upticks, and it, it will be one for the, for the military strategists to chew over for some time. Uh, my name is uh, Arnold Zeitlin, and uh, I covered uh, Afghanistan for the Associated Press in the golden years of the early 70s. Uh, you said you don't favor a pullout, uh, but what is the alternative to the mess you described? Um, look, this is a land of no great options. Um, when, I, when I talk about pullout, I was speaking sort of about something incredibly precipitous. Um, there, is a, there is a plan to, uh, to pull out combat forces by 2014, the end of 2014, leaving potentially some residual presence to engage in counterterrorism and security force training and assistance, although that number is yet to be decided between the U.S. and Afghan governments. And like Iraq, may well be a subject of, of much dispute and come, you know, right down to the wire, although, you know, the Afghans clearly have a greater need for foreign assistance than the Iraqis do, which sort of put them in a position of potentially having to accept something more than they may otherwise want to, but it'll be interesting to see whoever's in the White House at that point, what their appetite for a, for a follow-on force is. Um, more importantly is the question of longer-term uh, financial assistance to the Afghans. It was reassuring to see that the, the, the donor community uh, you know, agreed to a, a $16 billion worth of commitments, although will that money, actually will the pledged money be donated, how much of that money will actually get to Afghan people in relevant programs versus being siphoned off uh, by, by, you know, uh, corrupt officials and, and for-profit contractors along the way, and ample reason to be very concerned about all of that. Um, so w when, I, when I talk about, um, you know, uh, a, 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 a longer-term presence, it doesn't, it doesn't mean a long-term conventional U.S. footprint over there. It means a, a long-term U.S. engagement with Afghanistan in helping to support their security forces and helping to provide basic humanitarian assistance uh, in helping to um, uh, at least uh, uh, assist the Afghan government with some, some basic functions, perhaps not the grand kind of Cadillac scheme 
of, uh, of subnational governance that we've been trying to do for the past couple of years, but some basic governmental functions in the capital and in, 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 in provincial capitals. You know, it's, it's worth sort of noting that when, you know, the government, the Najibullah government, as you know, did not fall when the last Soviet tanks drove out of Afghanistan. It didn't fall a month later or even a year later, right? It fell after the Soviet Union collapsed and Moscow could no longer fund the Kabul government. And so for us, the question may, may be less of how many boots are we going to have on the ground in 2014 or 2015, but what is the U.S. appetite for providing some basic assistance to the Afghans? And basic assistance, unfortunately, is in the few billions of dollars a year. What is that going to be in, an in, you know, in a, in a post-2014 environment, particularly given all the financial pressures we have at home? And, and, and what, what's the price tag we put on various sort of outcomes uh, in, in Afghanistan? Okay, Ray, and then Nisar, and then here. Here you are, Ray. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that very fascinating presentation. I'm Ray Vickery from Albright Stonebridge. I want to explore, or have you explore a little bit, uh, the title of your book, The Little America. Uh, and I'm a little bit uh, confused as to whether the point is that economic development done that way uh, is doomed to failure and should not be a part of an American strategy in a situation uh, like Afghanistan? Or is it that it ought to be done right in the first place uh, and that it is very much a part of such a strategy, a la what you talked about in regard to the soil conservation people do, taking it over and doing it right? In other words, is economic development essentially a part of any strategy or is it something that America ought to shy away from and not get involved in because of the limitations that you've indicated? It's, it's a critical part of an American stabilization strategy in, in this sort of environment. And I think it was a – helping Afghanistan back then was a, was, a, was a noble thing to do. The problem is we didn't get it right then and we're not getting it right now. Um, you know, it, it, the lesson to be drawn, at least for me, from the, the, the earlier venture is that, you know, you can't go in too big. You, you have to engage with the Afghans at all levels, not just the ones who wear suits and speak English, that, you know, your, your projects have to be, 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 aimed, be sustainable. Um, you, you have to build the necessary human capacity. Um, and... Y y it was so painful to read that, you know, finally there was a, uh, an approach that seemed to work, and then the clock ran out. And, you know, I can't help but looking today and saying, all right, we have a plan to train the Afghan army. You know, it, some argue we're building too big of an army, but there is a plan to build an, an army that, that actually is a very respected institution in that country, flawed in ways that it may be, um, that we're stepping back from some of the, the more sort of silly, grand, local government and, and other, you know, massive development schemes, partially because of, 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 of financial constraints here. I just wonder if, if, you know, are we finally starting to get an approach right, but time's running out on us? Um, and do we, is, is that inevitable? Do we sort of, does it take us a long time to actually learn how to do this stuff? Or were there enduring lessons from that earlier engagement that could and should have been applied to all of us? So, I, I put that in there, and I open with it, not as an admonition to shy away from all of this stuff, but understanding how to apply it properly, and that um, there were lessons to be had that could have prevented us, I believe, from sort of duplicating certain mistakes, yet we chose not to really engage with that history. Joshua, in the third row here. Second gentleman in. Thank you. I am Dr. Nisar Chaudhry with Pakistan American League. Your presentation was very fascinating, informative, very eloquent. I really appreciate that. Uh, somehow, uh, you mentioned a couple of times uh, that Pakistan's gave, provided a uh, safe uh, heaven to Al-Qaeda or Taliban's uh, in, inside Pakistan. Uh, 
And uh, how would you rationalize this? The combined casualties of uh, NATO forces and American forces, and on one hand, on the other hand, Pakistan army's casualty is much more, many times more than them even inside Pakistan. And these were uh, committed by Taliban's. How could Pakistan afford to patronize Taliban's? They are victim of Taliban's. How do you rationalize that? Um, well, you know, we, one, has to, one has to look at Pakistani Taliban and the, um, what their agenda is. And yes, Pakistan is a victim of, 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 of certain Taliban elements. But certain Taliban elements also enjoy de facto support from the Pakistani national security establishment. And I, I recognize that that is, that is not a, a point of view that is a readily accepted fact in, you know, in Islamabad uh, or Rawalpindi, but um, uh, that, is, you know, that is not just how U.S. government, U.S. intelligence agencies see it, but, 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 but you know, much of the rest of uh, the uh, uh, NATO allied nations that have a, have a stake in Afghanistan. But, 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 there is an easy, but there is a clear explanation for this. Look, Pakistan has an arch rival. It is India. If Afghanistan, let us just assume, if Afghanistan was left completely alone, nobody meddled with it, no Pakistanis, no Indians, no Russians, no Americans, no Iranians, no Chinese, Afghanistan would almost certainly form a closer relationship with India than Pakistan. Clearly, the Northerners uh, are predisposed to the Indians for all the support that India provided the Northern Alliance during the Civil War. But even the moderate Pashtuns, where did Hamid Karzai go to school? They view, they view India as a land of economic and educational opportunity, commercial, a, a potential vast commercial market. They resent Pakistan for put aside sanctuaries for simply economic hegemony. The fact that, you know, if they want to try to sell crops, it's, you know, the only real uh, people they can sell it to, to are Pakistani traders. In many cases, some, some you know, produce is re-imported back to Afghanistan at higher prices. Go back to 1947, September 1947. Pakistan applies to the United Nations. What's the one country that votes against Pakistan's membership in the General Assembly? It's not India. It's Afghanistan. Um, and so this fact, the fact that Afghanistan would, if left to its own devices, be naturally closer to India, I believe is, is, is a clearly recognized fact in, in the Pakistani national security establishment. And it cannot allow uh, a, on its rear flank a country that would be in league with its arch, arch rival, or at least you know, potentially cause trouble. So it has to ensure that whatever government sort of takes shape in Kabul is, uh, is not going to be hostile to its interests and not going to be too predisposed to India. So there's a perfectly rational explanation for what Pakistan is doing. Um, it's just, you know, obviously not in keeping with what the U.S. is trying to do over there. And so there's a fundamental conflict. So someone over there, this gentleman here, and then we'll go to the back of the room, all the way to the back. Hi, my name is Matthew Asada. I'm a Foreign Service Officer, served out there in Afghanistan on a PRT, as well as with uh, Ambassador Holbrook and Ambassador Grossman here in the department. My question is, uh, I was very intrigued by the history that you've uncovered here and you've written about regarding Little America. And I wanted to ask whether you had done, uh, in any of your conversations with policymakers or people there on the ground in Kabul, whether or how those that historical record was factored into our present day deliberations. I mean, it takes a while for Freedom of Information Act to come through, but to what extent did Little America pop yeah. up in briefing memos and policy papers that went through the department to the national security staff? Because um, I didn't see that in the book. I, you, you mentioned it at the beginning, but I didn't see it coming back to that same theme. And I was curious whether it all came up. And the second thing is, um, Obviously, I have a lot of respect for the people that went out to Afghanistan and served. As you note, there's a lot of good people out there. There's also some bad people that went out there as well. Um, but one of the things that we're concerned about, and I speak as a representative from the American Foreign Service Association, it's the professional association, the union for the Foreign Service, is that uh, the security requirements that you speak of in this book mm -hmm. 
they really have prevented a lot of diplomats from going out there and doing their jobs. And you talk about all the people that are based out in the provinces on the PRTs, they were the ones that were most of which could get out, whereas the people in the embassy could not. And if you could talk a little bit more about the security requirements, what they mean for American diplomacy in the 21st century. Thanks. Two excellent questions. And, and thanks, for, thanks for all your do, you, all you did out there um, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, uh, let, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer both of them. And if not, please, please follow up. On the first, um, you're right, it, be, because so much of this is sort of real time, it, it's, you know, it, it, it's going to take some period of declassification to understand how much of this actually wound up in, in internal, uh, the little America history wound up in internal discussion. But you can bet I asked a lot of people about it, and I didn't get a whole lot of like, oh, wow, yeah, yeah, you know, that's, yeah, we, we read that. And, you know, in engagement with it, as I started to talk to people, people who are involved in policy today, as I was doing, you know, doing the stuff on the side, they were all fascinated. Um, it, it would all seem fresh and new to them. Um, and what, and in part of what, what it, you know, kept pushing me to do it is, you know, when I was talking to military officials, but also aid officials, um, they're, they're, they, they had this view that the project was a great success. And sure, Afghans look at it fondly because people of the, the current generation don't really understand what it was supposed to be versus what it was. They just realize that there's water in the desert, and that's because of the Americans. Um, so, they, but they never looked at what, what its original goals were. Um, so, there were a lot of people from from aid, military commanders who say, "Ah, you know, this was this was a you know great period of our engagement there. We're just trying to duplicate it, and never bothering to really understand the truth of it." There was a great 1983 evaluation report done by USAID, sitting in their files over there in their library, it's on the internet, um, that, is, that is prescient. It should be um, required reading for every aid worker, foreign service officer, and come up afterwards, I'll, we'll trade emails, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a link to it. I, I think that, that that report should be put on every, you know, aid person's desk dealing with Afghanistan. Um, it was done by a social scientist working for USAID in 1983. It's their own work product. Um, with regard to security rules, um, you know, this has been one of the one of the many controversial bits in the book. You know, uh, Ryan Crocker and others has taken some umbrage at uh, uh, how I've described the the relative tyranny of the RSO, the regional security officer, on the embassy compound. Um, look, foreign service officers put themselves at a great degree of risk surfing out there. I, don't get me wrong. Uh, certainly those who are down at the PRT and the DST, the district stabilization team level, are under, in some cases, even greater risk because they are out and about more often. They, they have fewer, uh, you know, uh, uh, fewer kind of security uh, 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 resources. They are, though they are with the military, and, you know, I'll say, you know, any day I, you know, rather be guarded by, by a uniformed member of the U.S. military than, than sort of, you know, contract personnel. Um, but uh, there is a view among many foreign service officers that I spoke with that the, the regulations in many cases are needlessly onerous. Um, they, contrary to, you know, th there's this military image that, oh, oh, you know, all those diplomats are weenies. Um, they're really not. Um, the problem is, is that the rules make them look, as one official said to me that I quote in the book, makes us look like women and children on the Titanic. Um, and, you know, they want to get out. They want to do things, but they can't. I, I, I had a, uh, w without trying to betray any confidences, a, a, a general, a, 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 a multi-star U.S. general who just finished reading the book called me up last week told me this remarkable story of how he, um, he was out there in Afghanistan and he had a you know, pretty good security detail and traveled around with you know, Black Hawk helicopters and gunned up uh, you know, US personal security detail. And he, he offered a, a senior official at the embassy compound um, a chance to go and visit a remote district that this official hadn't been to that was going to be you know, helpful to U.S. reconstruction activities. And the official initially said yes. And then two hours later, the official's uh, uh, 
uh, sort of secretary or aide called up the general's aide and said, uh, we'll need to bring six personal security guards with this guy. And the general said, no way. I mean, the, the Black, Hawk is, Black Hawks are full. You can have one seat for him or maybe two. But, you know, I've got, I've got six well-armed, you know, U.S. soldiers guarding us. Why do they need six contract guards for this guy? And the guy never came on the trip. You know, it's kind of absurd. Um, you know, um, and should foreign service officers be allowed to have a little bit more say in, in the risks they assume? Not forcing everybody to take risks, but those who want to, should they be allowed to, to do their jobs? Um, there seems to be a real zero tolerance for risk culture at the embassy, whereas on the military side, there's an understanding that some risk is essential to doing one's job. Now, I, I understand that foreign service officers don't sign up to take the same sort of risks as military members of the military do when they enlist or they, they you know, their commission as officers. But those who want to take some additional risk should be, within reason, it strikes me, should be allowed to or supported in some way in the furtherance of the, the mission that they're trying to achieve. One last question, all the way in the back. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us today. My name is Courtney Matson. I'm with USAID. I work in the Office of Afghanistan and Pakistan Affairs. And I'm actually writing about this very issue, and your book is very interesting. I finished it last night. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Just don't tell the anyone in the office you read it, and you're good. <laughs> I think some of the problems that you articulate are issues of US government mechanisms being maybe the word is too clumsy for some of the very nuanced projects and programming that we've been trying to do on USAID front, State Department, USDA, everyone involved in Afghanistan. And so I guess I wonder, what's your take on how we can improve something so fundamental as the US government's mechanisms for funding some of, the, some of this assistance and some of these projects? Because that's something that's at the core of our issues, but yet is almost impossible to address on this front. Thank you. It's a really good question. It's a very, I mean, I, it's a very complex question. I'm, uh, you know, far from a, a development specialist. From from my uh, my observations there, and 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 let's you know be clear, it was over a period of of, of, of three years in a in a specific part of the country. Um, you know, when when people. Uh, over in your shop say, well, why didn't you focus on all the great things we're doing with, with you know, education over here? Well, and, and I'll get to your point. My, my, my lens was southern Afghanistan because that's where the surge was focused. It was a period of years from early 2009 to the summer of 2011. So there's a geographic and a chronological uh, kind of boundary to the story. And that was the area that was specified as, as the, the thrust of the effort. And so I tried to look at what was being done over there then. Um, but you know, part of this, I think, gets to this, and it gets right to you know who we are as Americans, wanting to to do do the right thing, you know, with with, with the best of intentions. Uh, but there was this view, I think, early on, um, in, in in nine and ten, that we could reverse that 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 drift in Afghanistan and and really get things right if we simply injected far more resources in, and that was a military's view. It's AIDS view, it's state's view, White House's view, every, everybody. I'm not singling out aid on this. But there was this pressure to sort of do more, do more. As the military was putting more boots on the ground, spend more, you know, get, get a greater appropriation, get more diplomats there, with the thought that if you, if you simply pushed more inputs in, you would get changes more quickly. And Afghanistan, I think, if you, if you look at, at the past, you look at you know, the long past or the recent past, it, yes, some additional inputs does accelerate things, but but it, but it, but but the there's a maximum speed on the place, and it, it, it's not uh, it's not nearly as fast as is what we would like. And too often, the the additional inputs wind up either sort of running off in in waste or fueling corruption, or you get to a point where you're you're, you're saturating, and um, you're saturating in some cases with. With, with, with troop levels in areas, you're, you're oversaturating, oversaturating with reconstruction dollars. And um, I question whether back in 2009 and 10, there was enough of an effort to understand what those sort of saturation points were um, and, and trying to sort of tailor. And then when, when, when that sort of leads you to sort of m something more modest, you then can, can, can 
potentially engage in activities that don't involve, you know, uh, multi-hundreds of millions of dollar contracts to implementing partners that then, you know, people look back on and say, boy, that was, you know, really inefficient, or why do they do all that here and there? Um, and it gets you to things that perhaps can be done, you know, either through NGOs or through Afghan implementing partners, and while there is a role for you know international implementing partners, can that role be be be, be somewhat scaled down to sort of address the issues of you know the the distortions to the local economy, the the frictions with the Afghan government over private security contractors, and all of this the sort of the second and third order knock on effects that are caused by by that. But I think it fundamentally starts from you know this question of how much and how much is is enough how much is too much and there 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 there, there seem to be on and everybody's part just kind of a race to do more to show hey we're we're really in this to try to turn it around um without without sort of saying whoa wait a second what's what's the real level of engagement that's that's wise for them but also more importantly or just as importantly i should say for us so we don't exhaust ourselves there are other people who would like to get in this conversation. I'm going to suggest that we adjourn now. Rajiv will be out there signing books, so you'll have more of an opportunity to talk to him. Um, thanks for joining us today, and let's express our appreciation to Rajiv. Thank you. Thank you. Terrific. Terrific.